Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome David Daly to discuss Unrigged, how Americans are battling back to save democracy. Tonight with Nancy McLean, the acclaimed author of Democracy in Chains. Uh, you saw it in the waiting room, but I will remind you of our very simple Zoom etiquette, which is that you will remain muted, but we ask that you keep your video off through the duration of the event. There will be a Q&A after Nancy and David have a conversation. You can send me questions directly at any time during the, ch uh, during the event through the chat function. And I'll also be present in the chat function to uh, send links to purchase both Unringed and Democracy in Chains. If you have yet to purchase a copy, you can purchase them directly through Literati Bookstore. Um, and while you are on our website, you can also shop for other books and select titles if you live in the Ann Arbor area are eligible for curbside pickup. Also, if you are watching a recording of this on YouTube, uh, you can purchase books in the description below. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our events as they uh, join the ranks of our digital archive. Um, and we also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming during this time, whether you'd like to think of it as this week or this month or this year's subscription to our programming. But otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance, wherever you are this morning, this afternoon, um, this evening, for most of us. And without further ado, Nancy McLean is the award-winning author of Behind the Mask of Chivalry, a New York Times noteworthy book of the year, and Freedom is Not Enough, which was called by the Chicago Tribune Contemporary History at its Best. The William Chase, Chafe, excuse me, Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University. She lives in Durham, North Carolina. And David Daly is the author of Rat Fucked. His journalism has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Slate, The Washington Post, and New York Magazine. He is senior fellow at Fairvote, a former editor of Salon and lives in Western Massachusetts. Please use your Zoom uh, clap reaction functions to help me welcome David and Nancy. Folks, take it away. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me okay? All right. This is a pleasure. Thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you to Nancy, who is a hero in this world, and Democracy in Chains is one of the most eye-opening and important books uh, that uh, has been written in the boy in the last twenty years about the the depths and the specificity of the Republican plan, uh, the the structure of it all. So um, this is this is an an honor and a thrill for. Me, um, I think we'll talk a little bit. Uh, uh, they, they asked me to read a small piece, so I'm going to read a, a a really small, short section, um, and and then Nancy and I will have a conversation, and then we'll answer all of your questions. Um, and and thank you. Um, Literati is a wonderful bookstore. Um, it means the world to me, and in many ways, uh, this book began in some ways at Literati after I did a um, on the on the paperback tour for a rat fucked when I, I came out um, and met with the amazing team at Voters Not Politicians. Um, and I knew that they would be there gathering signatures that night for the anti-gerrymandering drive. Um, and it was just absolutely wonderful to um, be able to uh, see everybody and feel that energy. Um, and I wanted to have some, some other positive stories of what was happening around the country to share that night, to say, you are not alone and this can be done. Um, and I found them and they were out there. And so this, this book began with a quest or hope. Um, and I think even in these really difficult days, we can find hope. Um, I'm gonna read a small section that begins in Alabama um, um, from when I spent some time with the Alabama Voting Rights Project. Um, it's one of my favorite stories from this book. Um, and let me get into this. Um, the night that Haley lost her voting rights forever began like any other teenage evening in late 90s rural Alabama. A gr group of high school friends piled into a classmate's ride, a drive through run dinner on the hood of a car, someone passed around a joint. Then the sound of a police car rolling over gravel and two white officers wondering what that herbal odor might be. Plenty of cops might have looked the other way or let the kids off with a warning. 
In more affluent suburbs that evening, no doubt the same exact encounter ended differently. Haley's evening ended with drug possession charges for everyone. In the eyes of the state, Haley and her friends were no longer just high school seniors, they were felons. And in Alabama, felons guilty of a crime involving moral turpitude, such as this minor possession charge, an offense so small it would not be charged in many states, forfeit their right to vote forever. Haley was 17. She had yet to vote in an election. After that night, she never would. Her most important right as a citizen erased before she'd had the ability to exercise it. I had no idea, she tells me almost two decades later, we weren't thinking about voting at all. Well, the framers of Alabama's 1901 state constitution certainly had voting on their minds. The convention's goal, announced presiding attorney John Knox, was, quote, within the limits imposed by the federal constitution to establish white supremacy in the state. When the convention adjourned that September, delegates had effectively disenfranchised black voters in the state through a combination of poll taxes, literacy tests, and by labeling these minor crimes likely to be committed by the desperate and poor acts of moral turpitude. Those citizens could be deleted permanently from the voting rolls. The vicious in techniques had the intended effect. The number of registered black voters in Alabama quickly dwindled from 182,000 all the way to 4,000. Almost a century later, those very laws, hardly consigned to history, would ensnare, ensnare, <laughs> excuse me, Haley. Like so many vestiges of the Jim Crow South, it never really disappeared. Minor drug or petty theft convections as far as the early 2010s entailed moral turpitude. White collar crime did not. So when Alabama Speaker of the House, Mike Hubbard, was convicted of public corruption, defrauding taxpayers and making millions off his service, he retained his voting rights. When Haley was charged with drug possession, her right to vote was permanently taken away. Finally, in spring of 2017, with a litigation underway, Alabama's legislature ended moral turpitude for all but the most serious crimes, rape, murder, treason. Still, it wasn't perfect. Arbitrary fees often amounting to tens of thousands of, of dollars and applied disproportionately by judges to black defendants would still need to be paid before voting rights were reinstated. This was still a historic moment. More than 50 years after Selma, one of Alabama's most efficient tools of voter suppression had been put to rest. Trouble is the state was determined to keep news of this as quiet as possible. John Merrill, the Secretary of State, declared there was no need for a public education campaign or any effort at all to reach out to these newly enfranchised voters. He wouldn't even update registration forms to make it clear these 70,000 former felons were now eligible to vote in Alabama. If you change the law and don't tell anybody, effectively, it's like you didn't change the law at all. This is how I found myself in Birmingham, Alabama one morning with a really amazing young attorney named Blair Bowie, um, who was running the Alabama Voting Rights Project. They were going door to door searching for these newly eligible voters. They fill out the paperwork, they build the websites, they set up tables outside barbershops in the mall and libraries and the bus stations. I joined them for three days across Birmingham and Montgomery. They trained me as a canvasser. I hear Haley's story outside the Birmingham bus station just after 6 a.m. one summer morning as she waits for a ride to the hair salon where she works. When I approach and ask if she's registered to vote, she waves me away, embarrassed, uneager to respond. But Bowie trained me for this response. No one wants to admit a felony conviction to a stranger on the way to work in the morning. I simply tell her we're out informing people about a change in the law that a felony conviction no longer costs people their right to vote permanently. Her eyes grow wide. I can't vote. I have a conviction, she tells me cautiously, quietly. I hand her the clipboard with the list of serious crimes. If hers isn't one of those, we can sign her up to vote that moment. No, no, she says nothing like this, just possession. We were stupid, we were 17. I can vote. We walk through the forms. It takes a couple of minutes to give her back her civic voice. And by the end, we're both crying. I've never voted, she says. I was 17 and thought I never would. All I wanted to do was vote for Obama once. At this, her voice cracks but I wasn't allowed to do it. This is unbelievable. Felon disenfranchisement is civic death. Once freed, former felons tend to stay quiet about their convictions, making it that much easier to construct barriers between them and public life. 
Now those walls are coming down, having collided with another American notion of fairness. The story of how it happened across Alabama, Florida, and many other states is one of the most inspiring and surprising political stories of our time. An ancient set of laws grounded in racism is being torn down. And though obstacles remain, a new civil rights movement has grown around a simple yet profound phrase, when a debt is paid, it's paid. Wow. Thanks. Thank you for starting with that. That's so powerful and speaks so uh, profoundly to, to our moment. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. We, we spoke at one point, um, I, I think I was in your, your area um, for an event and, and we were chatting and uh, it was such a different world then. You know, we both wrote very dark uh, books about how we got here. I loved your book, Rat Fucked. I have a funny story for you, actually. I, um, I, when I, I was so eager for it to be published and so I was waiting for the day you know that it would be released and I called my local indie bookstore or the regulator and uh, you know the title's slightly off-putting you don't know who you're talking to anyway so I said you know I want this new book by David Daly and they said well what's the title and I said well it's rat fucked but there's some asterisks in there anyway and you later told me the reason you had that is because your publisher wouldn't let you include the word gerrymander in the title because it was so wonkish so anyway it's such an inspired title but I, I think it's really important that uh, you chose the example that you did both because it speaks to how uh, systemic racism that goes back centuries in this country is shaping the, the, the anti-democratic thrust of our, our moment but also, I think it, it really speaks to uh, the fact that we may be seeing some pretty significant change in the near future, thanks to the movement for Black Lives and efforts like those um, that you've described. And so I was just so thrilled when I read Unrigged because it really is the sequel we needed. You know, it really shows, okay, we have a serious problem here in this country and there are people who absolutely want to rig the rules and make it impossible for us to uh, exercise our, our democratic rights and, and make decisions on the things that are so important to us, um, from healthcare to the environment to systemic racism and everything else. Um, but you actually went out and got the, the stories that will enable us to do this. So I guess one uh, question I want to start with, uh, seeing as how we're in a presidential election year, is that, um, you know, there's a tendency among Americans at these times to only focus on the top of the ticket, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had about Joe Biden, 45, and who will be the vice presidential candidate, when in fact, those may not at all be the most important questions as far as turning people out or changing the problems that we've both written about. So can you talk a little bit about um, how that, that focus on shiny objects in presidential <laughs> races and in Washington got us into the mess that we're in and why you think it's so important to focus on what's happening at the grassroots and in the states and how you, some of your subjects realized that their problems, you know, that, that so, much of the, so many of the issues they were dealing with and trying to fix could only be fixed at this point at the state level. And you just have so many amazing stories of people doing that. Can you just share another with us about how you know how people came to that realization and and uh, what they're doing I think I think you're absolutely right you know um, and what we both talked about in our last books was the systemic effort by the Republicans over time um, you took a longer broader view and I really focused on what happened in 2010 in that in that cycle with gerrymandering um and it started down ballot um the the mess that we are in right now started because republicans launched a concerted effort 2009 2010 um as they stared at a changing at, a demographics of the nation as they as they tried to find a path back to power after two crushing defeats in the 2006 and 2008 elections um, and predictions that, that they'd become a minority party for a generation. Um, and they said, wait a second, 2010 is a census year. We redistrict after the census year. And they 
went and they studied state after state and said, how can we have complete control of redistricting in all of these states? And how can we lock the other side out and draw the maps ourselves? And if we draw the maps ourselves, um, we will not only be able to reelect ourselves in perpetuity, but if the people don't agree with what we're doing, they will have almost no recourse at the ballot box. And you all know all this in Michigan really well. You were one of the states. Um, and Republicans focused on 117 down ballot state legislative races mm -hmm. in 2010 for $30 million up. And by flipping those seats, they won complete control, not only of redrawing Congress for a decade, but all of these state legislatures. Um, so Michigan, Ohio, North yeah. Carolina, Wisconsin, Florida, Texas, Alabama, uh, state after state after state. Um, and this has had profound consequences on our politics. It's pushed our politics uh, towards this state of almost perpetual one party minority rule in some places. I mean, in Michigan, um, Democrats have won more statewide votes for the assembly in every single election of this decade um, on these maps, they've never once taken power, um, which is, is kind of staggering, but it's the same thing in Wisconsin. It's the same thing in Michigan, in Ohio and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and North Carolina. This happens again and again and again. Um, what we saw in 2018, we saw voters in five states stand up and fight back against this. It wasn't just Michigan. Um, it was also Ohio. It was also um, Utah. It was Missouri. It was Colorado. Mm -hmm. Red states, blue states, purple states. I mean, all of us hate gerrymandering. Um, it's it's cheating. You mentioned that it's less popular than herpes, which I thought was really funny. You know, it's not very popular. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so it's it's it, um, this is where it starts. It starts. Mm -hmm. down ballot. Uh, and it's 2020, folks. Uh, the next decade is on the ballot again yeah. uh, this year. Um, the shiny object is the White House and mm -hmm. the guy with the orange hair. Um, <laughs> our problems precede 45. Um, and if we only focus at that level, we will be missing the opportunity to fix this, which is only going to get un unwound at the local level. One, one of the stories that you tell about how that will be unwound uh, was especially, I don't know, invigorating to me and also amusing because you talk about the fuck yeah test. <laughs> yes. I, um, I, I just, I was so inspired by the, the women that you were writing about mm. there. Um, and you were, you were talking about run for something. And I think, you know, Donald Trump has been, you know, so catastrophic for America in so many ways. But actually one, one thing that I, as a historian, believe future historians will say is that he, his election was so shocking to so many that it actually has led to this reinvigoration of democracy from the grassroots up and people running for offices that they never paid attention to before. So I do believe that if we can break through this crust, you know, we're gonna see just an, an incredibly positive transformation transformation, but run for something is such a great example of the creativity in play. Could you tell us a little bit about that chapter? They're amazing. Um, you know, that's another one of my favorite chapters because it was just so inspiring to be able to spend time with these young people who um, had their hearts broken in many mm -hmm. ways by what happened in 2016, um, were ready to see the election of the first woman president. Um, and to have that moment and to have worked on those campaigns um, go in such a profoundly uh, different direction, uh, I think could well have crushed them. They could have be easily become folks who um, stayed home screaming at Twitter and 
bury themselves in an MSNBC bubble or something. Um, and instead, they put their talents, their campaign talents to work and they focused them down ballot because they knew that that was where the change had to start. Um, and they, so a group like a Run for Something is the uh, brainchild of Amanda Littman, who was, you know, a, a young and important staffer on the Hillary campaign in 2016. And after the election, a friend says to her, you know, I know somebody who wants to run for, you know, school board. Um, what should she do? And mm -hmm. Amanda was like, it, it's weird to me that I just got off this big presidential campaign and I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, and if I don't know the answer to that, Lots of people probably don't. So they build this amazing organization that has encouraged thousands and thousands of young people, people of color and millennials to run for these state legislators, for county judges, for school board, for council meetings. And they're rebuilding the progressive bench. They are getting people involved and they're getting them involved in the absolute right level. Um, and it's happening all over the country. I mean, a state- And their success rate was stunning too. Oh. I don't have the number in front oh. of me, but it was, wow. They, they have won a lot of races. Mm -hmm. uh, they have helped uh, flip legislatures in uh, Virginia. They helped elect this, um, the, uh, the, the brilliant new um, uh, judge is the title um, in Houston, who has done a terrific job of trying to you know, manage this um, a current public health crisis down there without any any real help statewide. <laughs> um, uh, in a state like North Carolina, where in 2016, before Run for Something exists, more than half of all the state legislative races didn't have anybody of the other party challenging them. Well, in 2018, there were folks up and down the ballot, every single one of those spots was filled. Run for something, sister district, a forward majority. Mm -hmm. These are the new young groups that are doing incredible, brilliant work at reinventing our politics from the ground up. It's so exciting. It really is. And I can see as a North Carolinian, I mean, I feel the difference from these efforts, um, from all that's happened. And it was, I mean, it's astonishing that for so long, all of these races would be uncontested, right? And you just see territory and it, it's crazy. And so, you know, now we're having conversations about what needs to change in places that weren't even having local conversations. Uh, so I want to shift a little bit though, um, from the substance of the, the incredibly inspiring stories that you tell about, um, about the activists who are making these changes and also these like the, the mathematicians who figured out how to fight the gerrymandering. It's all wonderful. But I want to ask you about your write, talk to you a little bit about as a writer, um, since we're, uh, you know, here at a bookstore and people are very interested in writing and, you know, author authorial experiences. And I know that you were uh, editor in chief at uh, Solar on for many years and that means that you reviewed a ton of writing right and had to think about what would work and what wouldn't and how to craft something and both of your books are so beautifully written and they also really move and so I just wonder how did all of that editorial experience shape um, your thinking about how how to design uh, this latest book in particular I love you know when you're writing about these topics that can sometimes seem wonky and mm -hmm. you have to find a way to bring people into them, you know? So, I mean, I tried, what I tried to do in the first book, I was writing about the, one of the most boring topics of all time, right? <laughs> not a boring book though, it's quite the page turner. Uh, I was writing about partisan gerrymandering uh, uh -huh. and, you know, a word so dull, as you said, my publisher wouldn't let me put it in the title. <laughs> Um, and so I had to find a way to try to make these, these, these maps come alive and tell their stories. Um, and so it was a question of trying to find the consultants who did this work, trying to tell the And story. we're proud of it, right? Of their craft. Yeah. Um, of trying to tell the stories in these individual states through the mm -hmm. eyes of, of, of people that the maps had affected, of the politicians who had who had who had lost races uh, mm -hmm. of of the 
of the behind the scenes um, sh chicanery that sort of drove the the process. Um, and I was using a lot of documents and court cases and and depositions and emails and FOIA requests. And you just had to try to remember that when you're taking on a topic that already seems academic, mm -hmm. your job as a journalist, as opposed to the job of a political scientist in some ways, mm -hmm. right, um, is to try to make it come alive and to show people why it matters. Um, and that was really what I wanted to do. It was, you know, I didn't set out to write a, a book about the, the history of gerrymandering. I set out to sort of, I try to enrage people that something so anti-democratic and, mm -hmm. and, um, and outrageous had been allowed to happen under all of our noses and that we needed to be aware and concerned and to, and to take action against it. Um, the new book was a little different. Um, I really wanted to go out and spend time with these people uh, and being able to embed in the middle of these democracy movements. Um, uh, after, and I'm sure you understand this feeling as well, right? We've both written depressing books and sometimes you go and give a talk and you feel like, man, well, I just suck the air out of the room there. I've got, you know, I'm, I'm the Peanuts character with the, you know, dark rain cloud over my head. Um, you know, I had written a book about how democracies die and I wanted to try to talk about how, how we get out of this. Um, and it was awesome to, you know, ride across Idaho in an RV with these, you know, young um, uh, folks of Reclaim Idaho who were fighting to bring back um, to, to, to expand Medicaid in a red state or to, you and know, won it. And won it. And won Idaho <laughs> with 62% of the vote. And yeah, which we, a story we all need in this time of the COVID crisis when, you know, we live in a country where employment is tied to, I mean, healthcare is tied to employment and people are use, losing their jobs by the score and the Trump administration is going to court to, to, to try to um, get rid of the Affordable Care Act, you know? So I think the kind of story you told about Iowa, sorry, Idaho, sorry to jump in, no, but please. it so speaks to our time and people's need for health care um, and how to persuade others of that who might not the, be a And they degree. successfully persuaded more yeah. than 60% of their neighbors in a red, red, red state um, yeah. to go along and expand Medicaid. And you're seeing this now in Oklahoma and Nebraska. Um, this can be done. Um, you know, I walked up to, we were in Idaho Falls on this hot day and we walked up to a house and there's a bumper sticker on the truck in the driveway that said Vietnam. We were winning when I left. And I thought to myself, maybe we should go knock on the door next door. <laughs> this guy probably doesn't want a bunch of activists coming up to, to try to expand Obamacare. They were winning in Vietnam when he left and he's still telling us this. Um, and you knock on the door. The other activists I was with didn't even notice this or if they did, you know, it didn't stop them. They walked right up to the door. The man answers, answers and says, yes, I'm with you. My family falls in that gap. I oh. signed your petition. I'm going to vote for this. Mm. And at a time when we can't even have like a Thanksgiving dinner, right, without worrying about it breaking into arguments, this to me was a revelation. We can still knock on our neighbor's door and have conversation and find common ground around these issues that really can unite us. Yeah, that might be a perfect place for us to open it up and see if there are some questions from the other listeners. I have plenty more I could talk to you all night, uh, but we may have some from other people who are um, listening. So we've got a, a couple questions, but um, I'm sure also people would be happy, Nancy, to hear your additional questions as well. Thank you both for such an invigorating uh, conversation. Uh, a question from my colleague, Carla, who, uh, special mention, uh, made this event possible uh, in, in many ways is the impetus for this event. So thank you, Carla. Um, aside from the state you vote in, um, where is the best place for a progressive to give money, uh, organizations or races to help win in November? 
Nancy probably has some thoughts on this too. Um, let me think about this. Um, it's a great question. Um, I mean, the lay of the land, boy, I mean, look at North Carolina, look at Nancy State. Um, if, if Democrats can't find a way to take back control of the state house or the state senate, you're going to have the same crew drawing maps down there for another decade. Um, and, and North Carolina will have another decade without being a real democracy. Um, there's, a, there's a new map that's gonna be in place um, after after the the old ones were um, uh, thrown out as unconstitutional in in the last year, uh, it's the first time that races have been run on them, and uh, they still favor the Republicans slightly. But um, if Democrats can't find a way to take a, a, one of those chambers, they are in a lot of trouble. Um, so I think North Carolina is a pretty important state. I think Texas is a pretty important state right now. Um, uh, you know, the Democrats are nine seats away from um, the state house there, um, and Republicans have already made it clear that they intend to draw state legislative maps there next time using citizen voting age population instead of the longtime constitutional standard of total population, which would have the effect. So essentially, that means instead of counting everybody as we do now, you would only be counting citizens over the age of 18. Um, and this would have the, the real world impact of uh, turning backwards about two decades of demographic change in Texas. Um, so I think, I think looking at those state legislative races are extraordinarily important. I think forward majority and sister district and run for something are doing amazing work on that. Um, and, and then I'm sure everybody's got a favorite, a US Senate race that they're particularly interested in? My estate is uh, apparently one of the ones most likely to flip, and the uh, choice will be between Tom Tillis, who, when he was in the General Assembly, was voted ALEC Legislator of the Year, <laughs> the American Legislative Exchange Council, who brought us this nightmare, and he's running against uh, Cal Cunningham, who's a, a very strong, I think, and incredible candidate. So that's exciting. Um, one thing I would say in terms of the question of, you know, where to invest uh, energy and if you have, you know, uh uh, other resources, money, and, and such to invest. I, I think um, the kinds of efforts that David talks about in the book are so important. And so, you know, when I try to think about what to do, you know, sometimes I give some to candidates, but also I, I think about organizing and who's doing the best organizing. And as we were just talking about with uh, Run for Something, you know, creating those talent pipelines, helping people to run for office, building the community and other groups like the Movement for Black lives, which is putting on the pressure for us to have serious structural democracy reform and to address systemic racism and, and economic injustice. So I think just kind of looking around at your area and thinking about your own talents and abilities and um, networks and where, you know, and your passions and where you can make the most difference, right? But where you see really good work being done, that's a place to invest. I mean, just a random example, but in my uh, state, as part of a national effort um, to do more rural organizing. There's a group called Down Home North Carolina, and they're working, uh, you know, in a, in a very, some very tough parts of the state, um, but organizing rural whites and blacks together, you know, in a kind of uh, race class fusion kind of argument. And they're really making headway because rural white people, as David was suggesting, with the example of the person with a sign about Vietnam, you know, they're, they're, communities are struggling. They are facing issues of unemployment, lack of health care, you know, struggling schools and all of this. And so I think we've got to be out, as you were saying, with represent us and these other, you know, like in every district, in every place, we can be making these arguments because we live in a geographically based political system, you know? And if you surrender huge parts of the country and huge parts of your state to the opposition, you're gonna lose because of the way that the system is designed. So I think that's a really um, important thing to keep in mind. Maybe another thing though, maybe I'll toss in another question and then we can go back uh, to others from the audience, but 
as an educator, I am acutely uh, mindful of the ways that the right has also tried to suppress youth voting. And I think, you know, much of the country, we didn't pay much attention to that, you know, in the headlines and stuff, because race, racial discrimination was actionable. And it was so egregious what the right was doing with racial discrimination. But they worked really hard to suppress youth voting, too. And you have a fantastic uh, final chapter that's called Youth Saves the Day. And as we go into this election in which literally youth turnout, I think, will decide what happens, you know, how motivated young people are, how involved they get, um, that's going to be crucial. So do you want to tell us about that story? Because I actually, I love it so much. I want to break it out and use it in one of my classes. Oh, good. Um, Absolutely. So good. You know, it's so tricky and it's so insidious what the right has done on youth voting. And mm -hmm. you're right. We talk a lot about what has been done as far as partisan gerrymandering and race, racial gerrymandering, but the, the, the generation specific voter suppression efforts um, are real um, and they've been devastating and they're so subtle that it makes it possible to try and get away with them, right? So you've seen some of this in Michigan um, where there have been efforts to force people to vote not where they live, yes. but to force college students to vote in person in their hometowns, which means on a Tuesday, you've got to go hop in your car if you have a car. If not, I guess you're going to board a bus um, and travel however many hours it is back to your hometown to vote. Um, you're probably not going to do that. That is a serious structural barrier. Um, you know, Prairie View in Texas, um, um, a historically black college um, in a largely white county. Uh, they are mandated to have, I think, 11 days of early voting there uh, in the county. They set it up so that it's really easy if you live in the white part of the county, if you're a student at Prairie View, you had about two days where the, the voting was actually close by. So it's a question of where you set up machines and how you schedule those days of early voting. In New Hampshire, they say, oh, wonderful. You want to register to vote here. Well, you also have to register your car. Um, which means uh, you have to pay all of those additional expenses attached with a driver's license change um, and a car registration. And perhaps if you're still on your parents' insurance, that may mean an extra thousand dollars for them over the course of a year. That's a poll tax is really what it is, up here and simple. Um, in Florida, they tried to pull the, the, the exact same um, uh, games in in uh, Tallahassee. Um, I'm sorry, in in, in, um, in Gainesville, uh, where, where the University of Florida is, um, and they set up all of the early voting stations about a half hour bus ride away from the, the university. Mm -hmm. You could have an early voting station on campus, right? The officials specifically decided not to do that and to put it all the way on the other end of town, really far away from where all of the, the actual people are, people who don't always have cars. Um, so all of this just skims a little bit off the top. This is what happens. It's, it's, it's all a question of, of putting enough barriers in front of people and perhaps the uh, voter ID a, a, a trips up a handful of voters, a handful of voters um, are tripped up because they can't, um, they need early voting or absentee voting that, that they don't have access to. You know, some are tripped up by precincts being across town uh, and slowly you chip off enough voters to make a big difference off of all of these little insidious suppression efforts in really important swing states like Michigan and Florida and New Hampshire and Texas, where a small amount makes a big difference. Yeah. 
So before we take another question from the listeners, just tell us one of your favorite stories of the youth who are fighting this, because you have, you know, in that final chapter, you oh, have they were, they were, young they were people. so magnificent. You know, I mean, uh, there's, there, there's, I mean, kids in New Hampshire um, at all of these uh, universities who worked so hard to try and beat uh, those efforts back, uh, one of whom decides he's going to run for the state house himself and wins. Um, you have the amazing efforts um, of a young woman on campus at the University of Florida uh, who makes it her mission to get an early voting station on campus uh, and fights and fights for it uh, because for you know two or three years she's running the shuttle bus uh, taking voters back and forth and finally she says oh, this is ridiculous why don't we have this and she writes an editorial that's published in the local paper. It's noticed by Guy Cecil, who was a University of Florida alum uh, who had run Hillary's campaign in 2016. He connects her with the kind of legal muscle that she needed and they won a lawsuit. And in 2018, there was an early voting center set up at the University of Florida so students could vote on campus for the first time. Florida's legislature didn't let it stop there, of course. They then said, okay, you can have a voting center on campus. The only problem is there also has to be all of this really easy, accessible public parking, which as we all know is the one thing that does Last not thing exist university. on a college yeah. campus, right? Uh, so they continue to sort of try to find ways to um, put barriers up. The awesome thing and what I try to do in this book is tell the story of people who are trying to, as quickly as those barriers are up, uh, they're trying to, to squire them away. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's one of the most fun things and invigorating things about activism is just that creativity. It's like, really, you're going to mess with us? Watch this. We're <laughs> back. And you really see that again and again uh, in your book. And it's just, it's, it's, it's like a shot in the arm. Let's see, um, John, are there any other questions from listeners? Yeah, absolutely. I have maybe a particularly meaty one for both of you. Uh, as writers who have documented symptoms of a specific two-party arms race escalation over recent decades, and seen as you both appear optimistic about the grassroots renewal of a liberal activist base currently underway. What are your thoughts on efforts related to ranked choice voting mm. or experiments that try to move democratic representation from a political class to a system of citizen representation? Did you come across any of that in your field research to unrigged respectively? Are there are these goals you could possibly speak to from a historical perspective? Fantastic question. And you have a great chapter on that, David, with Maine, right? I love ranked choice voting. I think ranked choice mm -hmm. voting uh, is, is um, especially, especially in party primaries, uh, is, is a real solution to uh, the, the kind of extremism and, um, that we have seen in, in uncompetitive districts. Um, I tell the story in the book of Maine. Uh, where you had a, a succession of governors, one after another, that were elected with uh, 35, 38 percent of the vote, something like seven out of the last 10. And some real nutcases, sorry, oh, but not a technical terms. Terms. <laughs> um, and, uh, and Maine wanted to keep the best of both worlds, right? They wanted to keep a tradition of independent politics and third parties and, and vibrant choices that were not binary. But they also wanted majority winners. Uh, they didn't want the plurality winners with 35% when uh, that person was a nutcase and 65% of the people wanted somebody else. Uh, so they brought in ranked choice voting. And um, I mean, it's worked magnificently. Um, the politicians have, have fought it as, as brutally as they, yeah. and it's been the political establishment writ large in Maine that has, has I, I think, been, um, you could certainly find Democrats and Republicans that have, have, have battled this, although it's Republicans now who are, are working most um, egregiously to, to try and undo its, its use of this fall. Um, but the political class attacked it, um, and the people not only put it on the ballot and won once, but they enact a people's veto and they put, they went out and they got it on the ballot a second time. 
you know, it, another one of those cases of a political whack-a-mole. And they said, no, you think you've broken us? You think we won't go out and do this again? They went out and they did it again and they won again. Um, and I think one of the most amazing election results in 2018 is in Maine, um, where you had a congressional district where this really came into play. Um, you, you had a Republican incumbent um, uh, who wins in the first round, or, or who's ahead in the first round of a, of a ranked choice election with about 48% of the vote, maybe 47% of the vote, just ahead of a Democrat and two, and two left-leaning independent candidates. Um, and because nobody was over 50% of the vote in the first round, they had to go into to the second round and all those backup votes counted and the Democrat won the race. Um, and that's the beauty of ranked choice, right? Is it ends, it ends spoilers, it, it, you know, whether it's Kanye West or Justin Amash or whoever it is who, or Howard Schultz or whoever the uh, third party candidate is, the, they get screamed at and they are outraged out of the race. Um, if we had ranked choice, we would be able to, um, all of our votes would have more power. Great question. Any others, John? Yeah, um, um, there was a question about sort of within states. So the question is, uh, what about Michigan? Senate and legislative bodies both are with a D governor. So yeah, here in Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer is Democrat, um, but both legislative bodies in Lansing are majority Republican. So I guess speaking to the uh, the way these issues affect just state governance. Maybe you could end with the story, which I think probably most of your audience knows about Katie Fahey, uh, about how that. to handle that Thanksgiving misery, but there might be a few people who don't and it's just so fabulous. You know, Katie, uh, Katie's magnificent. Um, and um, if, if Katie is, is on this call, um, I have one thing to say to you, and that's Flint. Um, we have a longstanding joke because we end up doing a lot of, of these panels. Um, whenever she says uh, census, I have to drink, and whenever, she, whenever I say Flint, she has to. <laughs> um, and Katie um, was 27 years old. She had a ticket for Hillary Clinton's victory party. She flew from Grand Rapids out to New York, uh, thinking she was about to uh, celebrate the election of the first female president. Instead, she went home disheartened and attended a very different event. Um, and the next day on Facebook, she's even more depressed by everybody screaming at each other. And she's thinking about what's going to happen on, on Thanksgiving dinner when there's, there's Bernie people in her family, there's Trump people, there's uh, H Hillary people. And she's like, what can we do? And, and she goes to Facebook early the morning of uh, Thursday the 10th, in which, you know, a morning some of us were probably still in bed. Um, and she writes, I want to do something to take on gerrymandering in Michigan. If you want to do something about it, join me. And she puts a smiley face on the end of, of it. Um, and it takes off. Um, this uh, Facebook post launches a redistricting revolution in Michigan. It generates um, a voters, not politicians, and they are just this grassroots a steamroller um, and it's all people powered. Um, it starts like this and it's, it's, it's a bunch, you know, it's, it's, it's young people, it's people who had never, be, who, who had never worked in politics before, all who organize around this idea that people ought to be drawing these lines and not politicians. And they write their own initiative language and their own a commission set up. They have to figure out how to get the 368 or however exact, you know, a thousand number of signatures. Nobody in Michigan had ever accomplished this without a paid petition, folks. And they marshal a volunteer army of, I think it's 14,000 people who go out and collect these signatures, they end up about 430,000 of them, and they win. They win with 61% of the vote in 2018. Michigan is going to have an independent commission drawing its lines in 2021. You're going to have a, 
a fair maps drawn by people, not politicians, after a decade of unfair rigged maps. And it's one of the most amazing stories of what individuals standing together committed can do to make really amazing structural change. When people begin that process of pushing back against these big structural barriers, no matter how big they are, how mighty they might seem, they crumble under that kind of su sustained organizing and effort. Well, while you both could be accused of writing depressing books, you cannot be accused of uh, hosting a depressive event. Um, <laughs> That was incredibly uplifting and edifying and, and it's such a wonderful conversation. And I thank you so much, both of you, Nancy and David, for joining us and talking to our book loving community tonight um, about Unrigged. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy, you can do so again at literatibookstore.com. If you're watching on YouTube, you can buy the book in the description. Um, Nancy and, and David, any, any parting words for, for our viewing audience tonight and into the future? I'd just say one thing and then let David have the last word. But, you know, I think that books about our moment are incredibly important right now, and particularly for this kind of grassroots organizing that David is talking about here, because we're at a moment when much of our national press and certainly our state and local press have kind of collapsed, right, with the transformation of journalism. Um, you don't have reporters in state houses anymore. You certainly don't have people on the labor bait or on these other beats that used to be, you know, really lively parts of state and local newspapers. And so so it really takes uh, people like David who get out and really talk to people and bring these stories forward to us in order to enable us around the country to see what our fellow citizens are doing in this you know, moment that is an absolute emergency for democracy. And so I think, um, you know, I hope people will read this and share it with others and maybe even, you know, local book groups and things like that could, could think, you know, well, what could we do here, right? <laughs> What's the next step in this? And they can do it because of of that kind of, you know, uh, dogged, but also energized and excited um, uh, journalistic work that David was doing around the country and that you're really just not going to find, sadly, really sadly, in the newspaper. So I think you do have to get it from books or from long form uh, journalism. But David, why don't you um, close us out? Everybody needs Nancy's book. Um, <laughs> Carol Anderson's book. Yeah, uh, is is magnificent. One person, no vote. Um, Heather Cox Richardson has a wonderful new history on, on how the South won the Civil War. I I recommend that to everybody. Gilda Daniels' book, Uncounted, on the crisis of voter su suppression mm -hmm. in America. Uh, there's a lot of fantastic stuff out there that um, people can be can be buying and reading right now. Um, I mean, I w you know, I think what is so exciting about this moment is that there are these battles underway that citizens are winning on behalf of what's right. They're led by millennials, by suburban women, by Americans of all ages and races across red states and purple states who simply refuse to believe that the idea that of creating change was beyond them. Um, there really is an unrigging underway. Um, and I hope that um, it can lead you to the same sense of optimism and hope that it did for me. But thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Literati. Thank you to all of you. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Uh, I love to end with book recommendations. I'll definitely add those where you can buy those books, hopefully from Literati to the YouTube description as well. David and Nancy, um, thank you both again, all of you who join in with us. Thank you for tuning in. Um, stay safe and uh, we'll see you at the next event.